I want to talk a little bit about why we care about IDLE in general and about service operations in particular. We do have certain goals for IT. So there are um, a number of goals that we have on any given day, but really what we're trying to do is to develop IT to where it's really providing more value to the organization. So at a very basic level, IT is responsible for keeping the lights on, keeping the computers running, making sure that people have the resources that they need to do their jobs. Going beyond that, especially as we are now moving into an era where people are bringing their own devices and departments are going out and purchasing cloud-based tools, sometimes without even consulting with IT, it's important that we try to keep on top of things to ensure that the sensitive data that we deal with is protected. We have many stories within the industry of IT that has failed to keep very important financial and health and other information private, um, and there are big repercussions for, for IT when that happens. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also want to start developing delivering value back to the organization by negotiating more effectively with suppliers. So I gave the example of departments sometimes um, going to the cloud for solutions. And we had an organization recently um, that I've been working with where their sales and marketing team had purchased um, licenses for Salesforce. So to really better maximize the value to the organization since they were already supporting Salesforce. They um, purchased and extended the Salesforce application to include RemedyForce. So anytime you have an opportunity like that within IT to negotiate with suppliers to really get some add-on value to existing systems, you're really maximizing the value, minimizing the support cost to your organization. Ultimately, IT wants a seat at the table with the executives when important decisions are being made. So when you're making decisions, certainly for a larger organization, if you have um, large enterprise platforms, you have ERP systems and, and other systems that drive your business, um, you want to be able to offer not just the technical expertise, but also the financial understanding to the business to show um, how you're providing value to them and how you can help them really um, maximize the value in your IT investments. So that's why we care about IDLE, and that's hopefully one of the frameworks that we use when we try to improve the service and support that we provide within IT. A little bit about the history of IDLE. And if you've uh, watched any of the previous sessions, um, this will be a bit, little bit of a review. IDLE has been around for many years, and it was probably around the year 2000, though, when IDLE really expanded globally. So it originated in the UK. It started to expand, expand globally um, more in the, uh, the early 2000s and became this process-based practice um, with which most of us are familiar. There were two books at that time, Service Support and Service Delivery. Many of those same processes have carried over to version 3, which was released in 2007, but it has morphed now into this service lifecycle-based practice. So it builds on the previous two versions of the framework, but now looks at this iterative process that we go through. So we have these five core lifecycle titles. At the axis, we have service strategy. Building upon that, we move from strategy to design, from design to transition, ultimately transitioning into operations. And then surrounding all of that is this concept of continual service improvement to keep this lifecycle going. Additionally, um, Axelos has complementary guidance. Um, Axelos is the current owner of the IDLE library. Um, and the complementary guidance that they offer include, uh, includes a number of titles, such as IDLE for small organizations and um, building an, a service catalog and some other titles 
that are helpful um, to implementing some of the recommendations or guidelines that are included in the framework. As I was, as I uh, worked as a trainer for the EIDL certifications, um, we always went through some basic concepts before getting into the actual processes, and I want to review one of the, some of those basic concepts with you here. One concept I think that's very important to understand is this concept of roles within EIDL. The roles are broken down primarily into process owners and service owners. Process owners are usually accountable for a process um, or the activities within the process. The process owner is not doing the actual work. So when we talk about the incident manager, for example, um, the incident manager is not necessarily picking up the phone or responding to requests that come in via email or the web. The process owner would typically be the service desk, ma service desk manager who is managing or overseeing the process and making sure that it is done correctly. Service owners are usually our subject matter experts, so the various administrators or owners of um, the multiple applications and systems that we have within our infrastructure. Something else to note about roles, they don't necessarily equal job descriptions. Um, I mentioned the service desk manager. That is usually the title of the person who holds the role of incident manager. Within small organizations, especially, um, incidents may perform, uh, individuals may perform one or more roles. So um, there are some roles that are sometimes not as compatible, but, but often, um, for example, I've seen the change manager and the configuration manager be the same person. Um, one combination I wouldn't recommend would be uh, incident manager and problem manager. Those two roles have very different aims or goals. Um, we'll talk a little, a little bit more about that in a few moments. Also, the flip, is, the flip side is also true. Um, within larger organizations, one role may be shared by several people. Um, for example, when we're talking about problem managers, those are often our subject matter experts. Um, so there may be a, um, a problem manager for servers and a problem manager for networks and a problem manager for desktops and so on. To illustrate that a little bit more, there are intersections among the roles, especially between process owners and service owners. So you can see, for example, if I am a network administrator, I would need to work with the incident manager, the problem manager, and the change manager to make sure that in each of those processes they have activities that um, are informed by information that I have about how the network works and, and what the service levels and, and other targets are related to my particular service. Likewise, if I am the problem manager, for example, I would want to be sure that I have information and input from the various service owners, such as email, network, servers, and so on, to make sure that I know how to handle problems related to each of those service areas. So now that we've covered some of the basic concepts, um, we will touch on some other concepts as we go through the various phases of the life cycle. But I do want to get into the um, kind of an overview and just go through the phases of the life cycle, um, partly as a review, but also to show you how each phase builds on the next. So starting with service strategy. In service strategy, we define our strategy. We make sure we understand how the IT strategy matches the strategy of the business. We do that by looking at various aspects of the service that we're providing and following the processes, including service portfolio management. Um, the first one there, service portfolio management, is especially critical because it helps to define what our planned services are and ultimately what the services are that are going to be approved for moving into production. So 
we have a service that's been defined. Um, we draw on all of the other processes to help make that decision. And ultimately, the output of service strategy will be our service requirements. So we have this service requirements package that in turn gets handed off to service design. Service design reviews the service requirements and weighs it against a number of other aspects or processes. So it needs to be sure that, or IT needs to make sure in service design that the service has a specific level of warranty. Warranty relates to these first four processes here, availability, capacity, security, and continuity. So those processes are all followed and, and those concepts are all incorporated in the ultimate design for this new or changed service to be um, moved into the live environment for the organization. It's also dur during service design that we strive to understand the service levels that are going to be offered as part of that new, new or changed service. Um, we define a lot of other components in the service catalog, so documentation here is very important. And we also make sure that we're working with the appropriate suppliers who are going to offer us the best value for this new or changed service that we're providing. Once we have our design, we then um, that gets incorporated into a service design package that gets handed off to service transition. In service transition, as the name implies, we transition these services into the live environment. Um, change management is really the core process here. During the service transition phase, we develop a service release package. That's part of release and deployment man management. And this service release package then gets deployed or handed off to the service operation phase of the life cycle. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in service operation, which is our topic today, we're focusing on the service delivery and support processes. Um, we are aiming for a steady state, keeping everything solid, um, maintaining those levels of availability and continuity, um, maintaining capacity and security within the live environment. The processes that we follow in service operation include event management, incident management, problem management, request fulfillment, and access management. And I'll cover incident management and problem management in the most depth during um, my review of this phase of the life cycle. It's also in service operation that we discuss the functions of IT, including service desk, the technical management team, application management, and IT operations. Now, of course, these functional areas are active throughout all phases of the life cycle. However, it's in service operation that they are really facing the customer and where we really focus on these functions. I would say that that same rule applies to the processes in almost every phase of the life cycle. Um, the processes are not necessarily constrained to a particular phase of the life cycle, but, they're, but they are organized this way to show which phase of the life cycle um, the process is really most predominant, in which it's most predominant. Um, 